What's going on guys, I'm Jody. This is Inspire Woodcraft. Welcome to my dining room. I don't think we've shot outside of the shop the whole time I've had this channel. Actually, that's not true. We did the dry bar install, uh, the collaboration with New Air. I think we did that about a year ago. I think that's the first and maybe only time that I've shot outside of the shop. Now, I had to sort of set up a makeshift studio in here and this is about the eighth time I've recorded this, so you guys are gonna have to bear with me. The kids are out of school because of all the craziness going on in the world right now. And so me being in the shop means I can't be in here with them. And so this is sort of me doing the best that I can here. Now this was supposed to be a all encompassing video going over combination squares, but I have to break this up into two separate sections. So in this video, what I'm going to do is go over what is a combination square, what are the features and components of it, and then more importantly, compare a low end combination square with more of a high end combination square and find out why I would pay 10 or $20 for this one versus why I would pay 150 or so or more for one like this. On that note, I will have uh, links in the description for hopefully all of these, but at least this one, because I think you guys will find this the most beneficial. This is a blemished tool by PEC. Regular viewers know that I picked this up, I don't know, about a couple months ago and I've shared this with some of you guys, but I purchased this as a blemish tool, which means I got it at a significant discount. And I'm gonna go over that more uh, towards later in the video, but for those of you that don't make it that long, just know that there is links in the description if you need more information on that. It's a good way to get a high quality tool, but save yourself some money in the process. Now in the next video, I am gonna go over how to check these for square. More importantly than that, how to make them square. The focus will be of course on these lesser expensive sort of low end tools. And then also uh, some little tricks and tips if you will on how to sort of tune these up and alter them a little bit so you can get a lot longer service life out of these. These aren't exactly intended to last a lifetime to begin with. Now I also wanna say that I'm coming at this from my experience over the last 20, 25 years of not only being a consumer and going to buy these in person in stores, but also working at stores that sold these. So there's sort of a lot that goes into all that. This is typically the style you're going to find at most stores, most brick and mortar stores, like an Ace Hardware, True Value, Home Depot, stuff like that. Now I know that there's gonna be some of you that say, oh, I found this other amazing deal at this one place, or what about online and overseas and all that stuff. That's not really what I'm talking about. I personally in my life have never had the time to stare at the internet for hours on end trying to find this you know, perfect diamond in the rough type of situation. This is coming out from my opinion a more practical standpoint. I need a tool. I go to the store, I buy it, I come back to work and I use it. And that's kind of where I'm coming at with this. Now I brought up the retail aspect because it's very important to understand not just how these are manufactured, but how they're handled after the manufacturing process, process is over with, how they're shipped and how they're actually handled at the store. You have to remember that with our lower end stuff, these things are like a dime a dozen. The same design all over the place. There's probably one or two companies that make most of them and they just have different labels on them. Now that can be also true for the more expensive. PEC happens to make and manufacture these exact tools for other well-known name brand companies. They just happen to have their own line as well. And from what I can see, they're absolutely identical to the other high-end names that we all have learned to know and trust. These, however, will come in some sort of a box or a case of some sort so that when they go through their shipping processes and they are driven down the road or flown in an airplane or whatever it is and put on shelves, they're not getting beaten, banged up. These quite literally get thrown into totes when they get to the store that they're going to be sold at, you know, they have this little cardboard sleeve that's on here that just gets hung up on a peg hook somewhere. And if you've ever been shopping and there's a peg hook designed for like 12 items, but the person stocking the shelves just had to squeeze that 13th one on there, you know, and you push one to the side and you cram them all on there. And then what happens? This eventually falls off and it hits the lowest shelf or it hits the floor. And so you pick these up, you know, it could be bent. This one in fact has a bent ruler. Um, it's always been that way. And so these just, they're not taken care of the same as the higher quality tools are. So really when you're looking at the cost between these two things, there is quite a difference. So just keep that in mind. 
Now again, typically, you walk into the store and you grab it. This is the type that you're gonna see. It might be a different color, might be a different brand name, but essentially it's all this sort of package. We have what is called the square head. That's this part here. And then you have the steel rule. Typically, you're gonna find a 12 inch, that's the length of the ruler, and you're going to find a six inch. I find that the six inch is more useful for day-to-day -day operations. It's very handy to keep in a vest or a apron pocket or something like that. Um, for video sake, the 12 inch is obviously easier for you guys to see what I've got going on here. Um, 12 inch is also something that comes in handy as well. Typically, you're only going to have this one head. There is some lower end models that will come with other things like a center finding head or a protractor head, but they're still going to be set up just like this. And also I might add they're more rare to find. These heads are going to be typically made out of aluminum. These blades are gonna be some sort of steel. In my case, this is a stainless steel ruler or blade with an aluminum head. That's important. They're cheaper to manufacture, but they also don't play well together. Because this is so soft and this is much harder, and because of the way that these blades are manufactured, it's sort of a rough process. Every time I slide this back and forth, and especially if I take it out and then wiggle it around to find that hook and put it back in, I'm actually shaving down material inside this head and eventually I'm not gonna be able to adjust it anymore. These have a limited shelf life. That's just kind of how it goes. But when we look at that head itself, you look on the back, there's this little knurled knob looking deal. You pull that out, it's actually a scribe. From what I've seen in older literature, this was more intended for scribing metal, but again, it works in the wood shop just the same. Now I will say, if you use this to scribe wood, you're gonna notice two things very quickly. One is that it works really quite well going across the grain. And you'll also notice it doesn't work nearly as well sometimes going with the grain. So when you're going across the grain, the wood has two different grains, if you will. It has the soft spring wood and it has the harder fall wood. And as you go across them, it's a much easier trip to go across the differences of grain there. When you go with it, a lot of times that scribe can get hung up in the grain and actually follow the grain itself. Those of you with the older not wheel type marking gauges probably know what I mean. So just be warned that if you do use this scribe to actually mark wood, uh, because it's not a knife and you're not severing the fibers, you're actually tearing them, this has a tendency to grab and pull in directions that you probably didn't want it to pull in. This also has a spirit level on here. The only practical application I could see using this for is to check for plumb. So I could set this on a post, check it this direction and check it this direction. And as long as they both accurately read level, then this post should be plumb. Again, I've never actually used it for that, but that's the first thing that comes to mind when I think about if I would use this or not. Aside from that, we have this knurled knob here. This one is actually more of a knob. Loosen it up, lets me slide this, tighten it up, lets me tighten it back down. You have a 45 degree reference here, a 90 degree reference here. That's essentially the tool and it's really no different than this one. So that being said, what is the difference and why is it that this one usually, or in theory, costs so much more than this one? There's a lot of little things going into these rulers even that account for the reasons why this one would be more expensive than this one. Typically on the inexpensive ones, you're going to see certain graduations and only certain graduations. And again, this is typical of what I've seen. You'll have eighth inch on this side and on the same face, but on the opposite side, you'll have sixteenths of an inch. When you flip it over, you'll have sixteenths of an inch and thirty seconds of an inch. That's it. You're also limited by ruler length. So if you go by a 12 inch combination square, you get a 12 inch ruler and that's just, that's what you get. Trying to find a ruler that is longer is probably not going to happen. When you get a higher end unit, you typically have options. So I can take this 12 inch rule out of the head. I can go buy just the rule itself in an 18 or 24 inch long uh, variety and put those in here. I could also buy another 12 inch ruler with different graduations. This one is what's called a 4R. In a 4R configuration, you have eighth inch on this side, on the opposite side of the same face, you have 16 of an inch. When you flip it over, you have 30 seconds and you have 64ths. You could also get this in a 16R combination, 
which is, or configuration, which is 30 seconds, 60 fourths, 50ths, and 100ths, which is crazy to me because I don't think I could see the hundredths inch markings very easily, and my eyes are still good, so kind of interesting. But for machine setup or something else like that, you might be completely interested in that. I believe you can also get them in metric and imperial both on one rule. I don't know for sure, but I believe you can. And then again, I could also have a different length ruler. So depending on the jobs that I have, I could actually have different rulers depending on different needs based on what I do. Now, when you look at the machining of these, you'll notice also that on our lower end ones, these are what I've always considered to be stamped. The edges are very sharp where they're a little smoother on this one. I have no problem running my hand up and down this one. This one is very sharp. It almost feels like you don't wanna put a whole lot of pressure on there. That tends to make this grab as you use it. So if you're using to draw a line from the edge of a board, this ruler is going to grab on your material, especially on softer material, in my experience, a lot quicker than this one will because the edges on this one are not nearly as sharp. Also with those ends, because they are not ground, they end up having you know, sort of these weird little valleys and, and indents and, and peaks in them a little bit. I, that's really hard to explain. But if you've ever sort of stamped something out and it didn't quite cut all the way through, so you break it until it pops apart, that's exactly what the ends of this one look like. With these, they actually will set these in a jig at a grinder, 90 degrees to the grinder, and they will actually register off the one inch mark and grind it flat until that one inch depth is met. And so then you have a perfectly milled end exactly one inch from the end of that rule. And of course they do it to both ends. So again, you're paying for the machining process that goes into that. And honestly, this is hard to show on camera, but there's just differences in the overall way they're machined. You can look down the grooves themselves and see that there's just a huge difference in the machining. When I look down the groove of this one, it's just one straight shot the whole way down. When I look into the groove of this one, it actually rides like this as it goes. You can tell when the light hits it that there's actually a whole bunch of little, you know, it look, looks like a mini roller coaster in there, honestly. And so, like I said, there's just mass difference in the machining that goes into these tools when they make them. As far as the heads go, like I said, cast iron typically on the upper end ones, you have aluminum on the lower end ones. And what this also means because, uh, spoiler alert, this is actually going into how we square them up. On the inside of these grooves, there's actually little pads that are cast in there. And those pads is what determines whether or not this ruler sits like this or whether it sits square or whatever. So as you wear these out, you can go through and, you're, and adjust those pads to square it up. And again, I'll show you guys exactly how to do that and a very easy way to do that in the next video. With the cast iron, it's not gonna wear out nearly as much, but also what I've personally found is that the pads on the higher end tools are a bit taller. So not only are you not going to remove material nearly as often as you would with the aluminum, but when you do need to adjust it or material does come out somehow, you have more material to work with. It means this tool is gonna to last you a heck of a lot longer than this one because this material is actually being whittled down a lot faster and when you purposely whittle it down to square it back up and you don't have a lot of material to work with to begin with, like I said, these have a shelf life. It's not gonna last you as long as you're hoping. Now again, going back to the higher end kit, you also have options. So if I want, I can put, and figure out which way this goes here, if I need to, I can get a centering head for this, okay? Now a centering head will fit on this ruler in place of your square head, and now I can put a round object in the center of this where this V is, and I know that this side of the blade is the center. So if I needed to, I don't think I've used a coffee cup as an example for very, very often. If I put that center in there, I can mark where that line is here, I can turn it and then mark it again. And where those two connect or cross each other, that that X, that should be the center of that. So if you guys are into turnings or if you find yourself needing to mark the ends of dowels or something very regularly, I would look into, even on a less expensive unit, getting a center head. One thing that you can also get with the higher end units, more so than you can 
with the lower end units, man, it's really hard to see in here, is a protractor head. And you tighten this down anywhere along the ruler, but what I can do is I can use this reference to draw an angle anywhere along there. And if I put it in the other direction, I can continue that angle. So you have 180 degrees of reference here where I can use this protractor to find and duplicate angles. This one happens to be reversible. They do make some of these that are not reversible. So I can use it on this side, I can use it on this side. I can draw this angle and then flip it around and draw the mating angle on this side and connect the two. So this is super handy to have. One thing that I will say is that if you get any of these, no matter low quality or not, that have a protractor, typically the zero marker on the side here will be a fatter reference than the actual degree indicating markers on the inside here. So what that means is that you're using a line that's like this wide with a line that's this wide. So you have to figure out at what point do I need those two to match up at? Is it right in the middle? Is it off to one side? So what I would do is find a known true 45 degree reference, something that you can use, whether that be the same head that you used before, or whether it be a dedicated like a miter square, set it up on a piece of material, then put this together and set it roughly at 45 degrees, leave it a little loose, then butt it up against that one. And when you get them nice and tight and they're both reading the same, tighten this down and then go back and look at where that those those lines match up it should be at the 45 degree mark but again where on that zero mark is it i don't think that's just a trait of this one all the other ones that i've seen have the same situation going on i don't know if that's because of an adjustment feature or what that i'm just not aware of but they all seem to be that way so my recommendation take that out in the shop once you get it kind of match it up see where those marks line up and then you'll never have to worry about it again so on the lower end tools, we have aluminum playing with stainless or some other sort of metal, which doesn't really play well together. You have cast and hard and tempered on these ones, so they play a lot better together. They're not gonna wear out nearly as quickly, and you do have more adjustability with these as time goes on, should one seem to get out of square. You also typically have more options with the higher end models. With the center head, with the protractor head, yes, you can find those somewhere out in the world with the lower end models. So if you're not really concerned about the materials it's made out of, if you're not concerned that you have to check it for square quite a bit to make sure that it hasn't gotten out of square as time has gone on, if you're not concerned about that, if this one works good enough for you, like I've said a million times in the past, then this one's good enough, buy them. But know that if you're gonna use these on a regular basis, I've seen it time and time again, you will be replacing these as time goes on. So I guess the good news is if you have a tool buying fetish and you just like to buy new tools, that's gonna satisfy you for years to come. I think that's about it. I'm going to now go get some stuff to bring in here to set up to show you guys how to square these up and start recording the next video. Thank you for bearing with me with the chaos that's <laughs> going on around us right now. Anyways, it was nice to have you in the home for once. Thanks for watching this video, you guys. I'll see you in the next one.